Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone out to the second session of our 2024 Student Ethics Symposium. Uh, my name is Brian Birch. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Ethics, and we're really happy to have you here. So this is an event that we host every April that features student work uh, throughout the academic year. And uh, the topic for this year's uh, symposium is very timely and relevant and provocative. And so uh, it, it's a delight to have so many students uh, involved. Uh, our presentation this morning is going to be by uh, Dave Loper, who is a returning student. So he's not only an industry professional, he's a returning student uh, and a PhD candidate uh, in IT. Uh, he currently is teaching here at UVU, uh, enrolled in the philosophy program, and as I said, working on a PhD from the University of North Dakota in information technology. So Dave wears many hats and uh, we're delighted to have him present. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. I'll just set that there in case I get thirsty. So um, today's presentation is on, um, on the uh, works of science fiction and how they work as a useful dialogue for studying philosophy. So uh, there's an important thing that uh, needs to be mentioned about um, science fiction when it comes to philosophy, and that is to lay some groundwork for the distinctions between science fiction and science fantasy. So this is a very important distinction, especially for people who aren't normally engaged with science fiction because there's a lot of stuff out there and it may just seem all too unreal for you to, to watch. And if you're watching science fiction or you're reading science fiction and it feels like it's fantasy, that's because it's not science fiction, it's science fantasy. So there are four main key differences between science fiction and, uh, and science fantasy. Uh, science fiction is usually in our future whereas science, uh, whereas fantasy uh, is in, uh, not necessarily in our, our future. It might be something that is an alternate universe or a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, right? So another uh, point to um, the differences is that science fiction carries an illogical extension of our technology. Like you could put together a path for how our technology today becomes that technology in, in the future. Whereas fantasy, science fantasy, has fantastic, potentially even magical elements uh, to it that uh, aren't connected to our technology. Uh, possibly an alien's technology, right? Um, not our own. Another uh, key difference is that science fiction deals with the ramifications of a particular situation whether or not um, it can uh, be something that is, is, is thought about, like this is a discovery that we had, or this is the trajectory that we're on, and what if that is the trajectory of, that we're on? What if a nuclear holocaust was to happen? What if we create a very powerful uh, AI? Whereas with science fantasy, the play is the thing. It is meant to be a story, and so the focus is on uh, e either like a hero's journey. This is something that makes science fiction sometimes hard for people to read because they don't see that hero's journey and so it becomes unrelatable to them as uh, necessarily a story. Science fiction authors try to put the, the story together um, as much as they can, but that's not their, that's not their main focus. Uh, the last difference is that there are moral consequences when dealing with um, technology. That is a specific high point of uh, science fiction. Like, what are the consequences if we invent this thing? What are the consequences if we have this dramatic social change that's caused by uh, technology? Whereas science fantasy is almost always a, a, a good versus evil battle. So, um, in uh, Anthony Walk said, uh, when, uh, if you can work out a chronology and construct a map to get from where, uh, when and where you are to when and where the story is, that's science fiction. Okay? So, 
which is which. So here we have two kind of situations where there's kind of a danger present. In stories, uh, Luke is training his force powers using a lightsaber uh, and a battle simulating drone, and Kirk faces an intelligent rock monster whose children are being destroyed by careless miners. So anyone, this is a low, this is a, this is a, this is a soft pitch here. Anyone, what would you say? Which one's fantasy? Yeah. Which one is fantasy? Yeah. More likely the rock monster. Is fantasy? Yeah. Okay. All right. Somebody have a. I would argue that it's actually science fiction because it takes place in the future. We have more advanced technology, and there's nothing to say that there aren't giant rock monsters out there. It's just to say we have reached that point where in Star Wars, there's unfortunately no Jedi in our world. So I would argue that's fantasy. Yeah, so with uh, Star, Star Wars, he's training a force power, which is something that, you know, is likely not something that uh, we as humans can have, right? Um, in the Star Wars universe, they, there's this midi chlorine thing that was put in in the earlier uh, episodes that, that generates this. And then um, in the Star Trek story, um, Kirk is actually dealing with um, the miners who are just destroying this uh, rock monster's children, um, the miners just think of it as a beast and can't comprehend that something that doesn't look like us could be intelligent. And it turns out the rock monster is intelligent and even learns the human language and, and burns in the rock uh, no kill I, for example, in the story, which is a really uh, uh, poignant uh, episode. It's it's it, the, the the rock monster in this is just I mean it's so much rubber it's just hilarious uh, the, the the bad special effects but it's a great story. All right, so here we have um, two stories dealing with uh, genes. Uh, Jerome rents his uh, genetic identity to uh, a um, a person named Vincent who is qual ca uh, cast as a degenerate in the movie after Jerome's paralyzing accident. And in this next one, Erin has a special bond with Pilot after a genetic graph gives her some of Pilot's space navigation skills. So the, the key difference in, in these stories is that um, in the first, which is from the, the movie Gattaca, um, we're dealing with a, a future that is potentially ours. And in the second, they have to transport the hero to another part of the universe and uh, where he finds and discovers a lot of alien technology that's not our own human technology. Yes, he gets there through some mixture of uh, some technology that potentially we could have, but everything in the story from there on out is different. So even though there's elements. Like everything, though, um, science fiction and science fantasy is on a spectrum. So in each of these different categories that I mentioned, you have various different um, levels of quality when it comes to how good they are. So many of you are familiar with the, the movie Valerian and with the movie Galaxy Quest. Um, in Valerian, uh, we have a setting that is uh, something that starts out in space. Uh, our space stations, for example, are encountered by alien species, and those alien species decide to add their own modules and other things to it till, until the space station gets big enough that they have to move it away from our planet. So it gets a good check on something that happens in our future. However, from there, our technology is diminished and other uh, technologies are introduced that are not something that we necessarily invented or came up with. Um, whereas with um, Galaxy Quest, this is a, a spoof based on science fiction conventions, but what happens in the show is that it is um, an, an, our near future, so it's not like in the, in the distant future. The technology that is uh, being talked about that's human is the radio signals that we've been giving off since radio and television started being broadcast. So the what if is the ramification of those signals being interpreted by a, a, a different alien race. Um, that alien race brings in technology, but they completely and 100% base that technology on the science fiction that was created in the, the worlds of, of the human mind. So they 
put the, 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 in a, they put the reality to the innovation or the idea not coming up with it themselves. And the ethical solution to the, the problem here is that the humans have effectively lied to a unwitting alien civilization and end up having to own the fact that um, we have such a thing as science fiction and we have this invented stories and that you know this other culture that doesn't have this kind of sense of of, um, of these things are, are, are left to deal with. So in that sense, um, it's, it's really important to understand that, uh, that ethical concern and humans stepping up to that as that. So in my estimation, Galaxy Quest is actually far more of a science fiction type of a writing than would be the movie Valerian. So where does this come back to philosophy? Well, um, most students are familiar with um, Euthyphro. Uh, Geech uh, says in Plato's Euthyphro, an analysis of, and commentary, that the Euthyphro might well be given to undergraduates to read early in their philosophical training. The arguments are apparently simple, but, not, but some of them lead naturally to thorny problems of modern philosophy. Another benefit that could be gained from reading Euthyphro is that the reader may learn to be forewarned against some common fallacies and debating tricks in moral disputes. So what I argue in, the, in my research is that um, science fiction acts very much like the Euthyphro dialogue does. So Euthyphro is given as a play, you know, kind of this interaction deals with this moral concept. And, uh, and he has to... Uh, put together in the story of the play kind of this narrative. And science fiction does that as well. And that's why it's key to understand the differences between science fiction and science fantasy. Because one of the things that science fiction does for us is that oftentimes it's very dystopic in nature. And the reason why it paints the dystopic picture is so that we can avoid that dystopia. So it works as a story from the standpoint of seeking catharsis rather than seeking uh, kind of the, the, the comedy. So I would argue that the space fantasy is more in the realm of what would be classically referred to as a comedy, and science fiction works more like a tragedy. And untaps that catharsis, oh, well, it's not as bad for us as it is for these people in this book. Or I can see a pathway forward so that our world doesn't end up like this. What do we need to have as far as morals or ethics in order for us to not get to uh, that point? So uh, Nik Nikolova Bag Baglovesta said, for the futures research realm, this always has to be a conceptual vantage point when considering social change technology and progress. Not for the sake of an overextended horizon of the foresight effort, but as a premise allowing reflex reflexivity on our own cognitive closures. This, in turn, would inspire novel transformative strategies for the future. Crucial in such endeavor is the conceptual dialogue between science fiction, science fiction and future study and the issue of plausibility. Did I lose signal? I think we did. I don't know what I did here. Yep. This cord, but I don't know what it plugs into. That's the only thing I've got. Should it pop out there? No, I don't know where it's going to. It's possible what it popped out. Is that better? Well, we can hope. Okay, I will avoid cords as much as possible. Okay, so for the rest of my um, talk, it's, it's pretty open-ended. I have a lot of material here, and there's no way that I can get through it all in, you know, in, a, in a certain amount of time, because part of what I want to do also is to engage on some of these topics with you. So um, what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about um, specific works their context, and we're going to give an overview of the, the work in some context, and then talk about some of the dialogue that exists in some of these works, and then um, provide some analysis. And I have some research that talks about kind of our current modern 
situation with such topics. And then I'd like to invite any of you to um, share your thoughts and, and, and opinions about that uh, as well. So uh, before we get to that, there is some general context that applies to all of this. So Alan Turing, um, some of you have seen the movie, The Imitation Game. Um, that's kind of a good way to get you interested in Alan uh, Turing. Fascinating individual, very amazing. Every single computer that we have today can be reduced to what is called a Turing machine. So every single computer out there could be reduced to what could be done on a piece of paper. So Alan Turing invented the process upon which all modern computers are based. And you can take any algorithm and reduce it to a single ticker tape of ones and zeros and be able to process that ticker tape in order to come up with every solution that we have on every computer today. It would be a lot of ticker tape that would, you would have to do, but theoretically every computer can be reduced into the doctoral thesis that Alan Turing did for his PhD. So that's an amazing uh, uh, thing. So he proposed um, in his um, 1950 paper, he said, I propose to consider the question, can machines think this should begin with definitions of the meaning of the terms machine and think. The definitions might be framed so as to reflect, so far as possible, the normal use of the words, but this attitude is dangerous, okay? So um, when it comes to what we uh, perceive as, as AI, it's important to know that there are, there are multiple levels. We toss AI around like a, you know, just as a term here and there, but there are actually different levels. AI is actually the lowest level of resolution when it comes to what we have now in, uh, in these algorithms that we're talking about today. On that, that AI has been around since a long, long time ago. Somebody mentioned in the previous session that we use AI, for example, to do spam filtration. A lot of spam filtration uses a Bayes, a naive Bayes formula to do kind of comparisons between a language model that's good and a language model that's bad. So these statistical analysis, they've been going along for a long time. And on top of that, the more, uh, more sophisticated layer is called machine learning, okay? Above that, you have deep learning. Above that, you have uh, generative uh, AI um, or uh, artificial generative, uh, general intelligence. And then above that, and this is the one we don't have yet, but this is the one that becomes scary in a lot of science fiction, is the artificial superintelligence, okay? So some of the works that we um, are, are gonna discuss uh, talk about that. So here's the, here's, the, here's the pool from which you, you as the audience can pull from. Um, we don't have to pull a specific title. If there's a specific topic, we can go to some of the general topics out there in some of those books, but can I have somebody choose one of these works maybe some of you, you know of? Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? A very good choice. Okay, what do you know about that book so far? Um, so I was in, the, in my academic writing class and actually focused on that book throughout the semester and wrote like our final papers on it. Um, the people, I actually, Told I haven't seen Blade Runner myself, but for those who have seen Blade Runner, um, that is this is the novel that it's based on. Perfect. And oh, and I guess would you like me to kind of overview a basic premise? Yes. What I remember. Yep. Um, basic premise is then that. I don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's been a few semesters, so let's see if I can fill in the gaps. But there's it's based off a man who lives in a futuristic society where. There's basically this dichotomy between the few, I guess, the few humans remaining on Earth and robots, um, robotic, very human-like um, cyborgs. Is they that what they call them? Replicates, yeah. Replicates that are AI. And overall, it's kind of this idea that kind of they're trying to figure out like this. I feel like I approach with the ethical dilemma of like, is it are humans, and at that point, the AI and how far it's advanced to be so humanoid, do, is there empathy between them? You know, what, what things are, 
you know, what creatures are considered like real and should have, you know, rights. But the generally the the androids are looked down upon by the remaining humans and they're kind of the main character, right? He's um a what a bounty hunter? Rick Decker, yeah. Yeah. He's his job is basically to hunt down and kill remaining android human like yes. creep beings. Yeah. yeah. And, and and they don't use the word kill, they, they use the word retire. Yeah. Which is an interesting thing. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about mm-hmm. that um, a little bit. So within the framework of, of the novel, there is this type of test called the Void Kampf test. And what this test is to is used to do is to determine whether or not a person is talking to a replicant or a real person. Okay? And so the reason why this is really important when we talk about our measurements today, these are some sample questions from an EQ test, is that um, is this really a measurement that um, can be applied with accuracy to determine whether or not somebody is human? And um, so uh, as a little bit of background, uh, Baron Cohen and Real Right say, um, clinically, the empathy measurements provided by the EQ are used by mental professionals in assessing the level of social impairment in certain disorders like autism. However, since levels of empathy vary significantly between individuals, even between those without any mental health disorders, it's also suitable for use as a casual measure of temperamental empathy by and for the general population. So in the Voight Comp test, um, some of the dialogue um, here uh, from the book said, um, so this is from the movie, I'm gonna quote some of the movie because it's uh, pretty pretty interesting. So uh, there is a, 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 a woman and Rick Decker is testing to see whether or not she's a replicant and uh, she says, as they begin the test, do you mind if I smoke? He says, it won't affect the test. All right, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Just relax and answer them as simply as you can. It's your birthday. Someone gives you a calfskin wallet. Now, while he's asking these questions, he's zoomed into her eyes, looking at the reflexive responses that she's giving. And she says, I wouldn't accept it. Also, I report the person who gave it to me to the police. Now, in this time period, like, there's no more animals. Like, animals are super rare. And so they have a lot of laws concerning, like, the protection of any sort of life that is like more developed, like trees. There's no trees, there's no uh, dogs and cats. If you see dogs and cats, they're probably robotic, right? He says, uh, you have, uh, you've got a little boy. He shows you his butterfly collection plus the killing jar. He said, I, she says, I take him to the doctor. You're watching television. Suddenly you realize there's a wasp crawling on your arm. I kill it, says Rachel. You're reading a magazine, you come across a full page nude of a girl, and she asks in response, is this testing whether I'm a replicant or a lesbian, Mr. Deckard? So these types of questions are supposed to be probative. What's interesting about Rachel's responses and the questions that she asks um, uh, Rick Deckard in the movie ahead of this kind of captures the whole um, the, the plot that you're talking about. She is testing to see whether or not in my opinion, she's also testing to see whether or not he is a replicant. Because she asks some very emotionally charged questions as well. So the question then becomes, and there's a lot of theories online, was Rick Decker really uh, a replicant himself? Um, that, that's addressed later in movies, but um, what's interesting about this um, conversation, and here's some of the questions she asks him, right? Do you like our owl? He says, it's artificial? Of course it is must be expensive. Very, she says. I'm Rachel. Deckard. It seems you feel our work is not of a benefit to the public. He says replicants are like any other machine. Either they're a benefit or a hazard. If they're a benefit, it's not my problem. May I ask you a personal question, she says. Sure. Have you ever retired a human by mistake? No. But in your position, that is a risk. You can see how emotionally charged these questions are in the dialogue given in the movie. And there are similar um, types of dialogues that are also important. The reason why this piece of work is is really important for us today also has to do with the fact that um, we seem to place empathy as a 
criteria for consciousness. And so one of the quotes that is from the book says, empathy he had once decided must be limited to herbivores or anyhow omnivores who could depart from a meat diet because ultimately the empath empathic gift blurred the boundaries between hunter and victim, between the successful and the defeated. Interestingly enough, today we have research that actually kind of affirms this um, philosophical dialogue. So in the paper by Holler et al. Um, called The Differences Between Omnivores and Vegetarians in Personality Profiles, they state, these studies indicate that vegetarians significantly differ from omnivores in their personality values and the ability to be empathetic. Omnivorum is associated with an increased orientation towards social dominance, greater right-wing authoritarianism, and in line with this, a stronger tendency to be prejudiced. So here is kind of this, this idea that the empathy level on, on humans actually may differ and may end up putting them into different social strata based on specific empathy. So what does that mean then to people who are neurodivergent, right? Um, this raises an interesting specter. So some of the research I, I, I collected from Botha and Cage uh, on the autism research is in crisis. Um, they, uh, they stated that while not all autism research is ableism, autism researchers can be ableist, including by talking about autistic people in subhuman terms, dehumanization, treating autistic people like objects, objectification, and making othering statements which set autistic people apart from non-autistic people and below this status, stigmatization. So here are some key things that are actually addressed in the book. And you also mentioned, um, having read it as a class, this idea of, of talking about em empathy and othering of, of people. And I think that's really important because when we start to classify AI and, and look at the uncanny valley, a lot of times we're looking to see whether or not this empathy element exists. But by doing so and creating some prejudices against AI in this way, we're also leading ourselves into this type of uh, psychopathy that is harmful to people that are actually just neurodivergent humans. So caution is, uh, while autism is not the focus of this story, many of the characters behave in, in very, um, in, in very uh, low EQ ways in the book, so as to always raise that question in your mind. You know, am I talking to a human or am I talking to a, a replicant? So we are in that sphere of problem. One thing that is a quote from the book is, an android doesn't care what happens to another android. That's one of the indicators we look for. Well, we know that there are humans that do this as well. So I have a question for you. Uh, should I keep going? Do we have Connor here? Oh, you're here. OK. Well, I will close up with this book. I will have these slides um, available uh, on my LinkedIn profile and the uh, draft of the research that I'm working with. Um, so uh, yeah, lots and lots of different thing here. Here's my, cite my citation and sources. So uh, please ask me questions uh, later. Uh, yes. Later. Yeah. Yeah. I, we didn't need to make. What do we do? The same presentation. Yeah. So first off, I just want to thank you guys for coming here today. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Connor Wyatt. I'm an English major. It's my final semester here at UVU. Um, and for my project today, um, it's a culmination of me and some other classmates in our health informatics class. Um, it's looking at AI and relating it to medical billing and coding. Um, just looking at the origins, looking at the pros and cons, and then also just looking at some approaches we can take to ensure that um, AI is properly used with the medical billing and coding. Um, and so through this oral exploration, I would like the three areas of AI in particular in relation to medical billing and coding I would like to look at are 
um, looking at the gray nature of patient privacy within the scope of AI, um, the dissection of bias training data, and then also um, just ensuring that everyone fully understands the scopes of AI and how it's properly being used within the field, and just ensuring we're all on the same page. Um, and with the nature of this presentation, honestly, some of this information might be irrelevant you know, in the future, especially given my rhetorical stance. I'm by no means a medical professional at all. Um, really, what this presentation is about is I just want to bring awareness to you guys, just let you know how AI is being used in the medical field, what the pros are, what the cons are, and then, like I mentioned, just some approaches we can all take to try and make sure that AI um, is used the best for us and just helps everyone out. Um, and so to begin this process, I'll just talk about the early implementations of AI. Um, so from, from my research, um, it looks like from the late 90s to the early 2000s is when AI was properly introduced into medical billing and coding, and it began with machine learning. Um, the first instance I can especially see is with charge capturing. And if you're unfamiliar with charge capturing, I totally understand. It's a pretty simple process. Um, it's just taking physician notes and then translating it into the appropriate medical codes for billing purposes. Um, and AI, when it was first introduced, um, greatly helped with that. And then also some other challenges that it helped mitigate was just making the complexity of coding systems for coders much less complex. Um, coding systems are very complex. They can be very hard for coders, especially when you have different multiple systems being used at the same time. So AI helping to streamline that process can greatly, greatly help with this. And this also ties into medical billing, of course. Medical coding and medical billing go hand in hand. Um, the accuracy of medical billing, if coding is better, the accuracy is better. And that can lead to less claim denials and, del and less delays in reimbursement. And it also improves overall healthcare providers' revenue. And so to kind of tie that all in, the three major issues addressed by AI are coding efficiency, reduced errors, and standardization. And so the actual results with statistics we can see here, it did absolutely enhance charge capturing. Um, a study by the Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association found that AI-powered charge capture systems improved revenue capture by 5 to 10%. Um, this translates to increased financial stability for healthcare providers. Um, we also saw, of course, improved medical billing accuracy. A study in the Journal of Medical Economics found that AI reduced claims denials by up to 25%. And then just overall for coders, just their overall productivity and efficiency also went up as well. Um, a 2022 study published in the International Journal of Medical Informatics found that AI-powered coding tools improved coder productivity by an average of 12.7%. Um, this translates to coders being able to handle more cases in a short time frame. And how this was exactly calculated was through the equivalent full-time employment codes processed per hour. Um, this accounts for even part-time coders and adjusts their output to a full-time equivalent basis. Um, this ensures a standardized measure of coding volume for everyone. Um, and through this, we were able to see that it did have some positive effects for sure. But then looking at some of the negatives, we can see that this is a nuanced issue and AI isn't all pros and there are some things we need to address. Um, AI, when used in medical billing and coding, can rely on data quality too much. Um, if physicians' notes aren't properly filled out the proper way, AI can have a really hard time um, processing those physician notes. Um, everything has to be streamlined for AI, and if there's slight mitigations, it can cause issues for the data. Um, also, that this can obviously lead to major changes for coders. Coders will always have work, but in the future, with AI being more implemented, um, their work will definitely change. Um, it will almost be like a supervisor of sorts to AI, just ensuring that it's properly used. And a lot of the mundane, routine tasks that they used to do on a daily basis will now be done by AI. And then also the other major issue is the black box problem, which I like to relate to uh, data biases. Um, AI not just within the medical um, healthcare fields, um, really just any facet of life affected by AI. Um, it's heavily affected by the people who put in prompts and who design the AI. And if that's only a certain set demographic, then AI prompts can, without even meaning to, only cater that audience. Um, and we definitely see that with AI relating to health informatics. And so just to have a story, just to kind of showcase 
um, some of these ideas and effects. I was lucky enough to talk to my mom. Uh, my mom's been a dentist for a really long time. And she was talking to me recently about how uh, within their offices, they're implementing AI into their systems. And while it's great for medical billing and coding for the most part, um, one major issue of it is the fact that it can sometimes oversell and overbill procedures that don't need to happen. And the reason why this is a major concern is for new medical health professionals who don't have a lot of experience um, and also just medical professionals who are too influenced by money can over rely on this AI and its diagnostics from the medical coding and can over rely on that rather than on human personal experience. Um, the example she gave me is there was a, a case in a, a patient she was working on where the system asked her to do five extra teeth crownings that didn't need to be done. And while it's kind of a hindrance and annoying in that instance, imagine if it was a biopsy or if you had to get a leg or a foot amputated. Um, it definitely raises concerns and it definitely showcases how while AI becomes more and more implemented into all facets of life, no matter what, there needs to be human intervention and human experts to ensure that you know, human interests and just individuals are put first over financial gain. And so to ensure more ethical AI use, um, to kind of tie it all in, um, like I mentioned, data biases need to be addressed. Um, that can be done through implementing more diverse development teams throughout the world. Um, crossing all boundaries of race, gender, ethnicity, um, and beliefs, and also just finding more unique niche data collection methods to mitigate bias as well. Another thing as well, of course, is to make AI more explainable, not just in the healthcare industry, but in all facets it affects. Um, in relation to the healthcare field, I would love for um, insurance companies and healthcare professionals to come together with AI professionals and software developers to, to learn and understand how AI is going to be used moving forward and to look to find the solutions to mitigate the anecdotal story I gave about the crown teeth. Um, I think this would help in the long run. I think this would foster um, more trust between everyone involved in the healthcare field, um, patients, insurance companies, providers, and overall we can benefit from it moving forward. And then also the, the tie in, the last thing I'd like to mention is this patient privacy and security. Um, also kind of ties in the transparency. I would like to see patients knowing and understanding um, how their data is being manipulated and used. Um, I would like everyone just to be more on the same page. And I think that can also greatly help as well. And to just tie it all in, um, AI, whether we like it or not, it's going to be used within the healthcare industry. It's going to be used in all facets of our lives. That's why I also propose AI to be implemented to our, into our lives as soon as possible. I would like to see schools from elementary all the way up to college uh, introduce AI classes. And especially within college, I would like every major and department to incorporate an AI class into their fields so their students can better understand how to use it um, for their own benefit. And that's more or less it. I thank you guys for coming to my speech, and I really appreciate it. We have a few minutes for Q&A, about seven minutes. So uh, I'll bring the mic around. Oh, Elena has the mic. Thank you. C can I ask a question for, to each of you? Yeah. Uh, so Dave, um, Blade Runner is one of my favorite movies. Okay. <laughs> so I, 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 so I, I think about it a lot, like all the time, okay? So what I wanted to ask you about that is, you know, your wonderful argument there about empathy and how empathy seems to be the crux around which in the film, you know, the characters, but also we as the viewers kind of decide, is this a robot or not, and then what is empathy, right? So, okay, so my question is, it occurs to me in, in the AI discussion now that perhaps, perhaps the reason why one wonders whether Deckard is a replicant or not, okay, 
doesn't it have to do with the fact that he's like so much part of his world, right? In other words, he's used, he's immersed in his own time and his own technology. And I think the novel makes that more clear than the movie, right? All that, it, like hyper social media and they're con always surrounded by TVs and commercials and uh, like hyper AI if you want, right? So, okay, so my question is, it occurs to me that one could make the argument that maybe part of Deckard's lack of empathy is his immersion in so many communication technologies. And if that were an acceptable argument, then that is terrible for what awaits us, no? So what do you think about that? So, yeah, I, 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 have a, I, I agree with uh, Connor a lot when he was talking about how AI needs to be talked about in all of the yeah. disciplines because students need to understand like what is this world going to look like yeah. with AI and how to avoid um, that particular trap. Uh, earlier we were talking about content creators and you know the dangers that AI put, presents to them. When I talk to my students, I, I like to bring out Bloom's taxonomy mm -hmm. and show them what that looks like. Because in many ways, um, our technology is chewing up the lower layers of Bloom's taxonomy. Yeah. When you talk about when the internet you know, came on the scene in education, it was a real, uh, you know, it was a real kind of an apocalyptic situation for a lot of educators because a lot of education spent so much time dealing with this information layer. When I was a kid, I had to learn all the capitals to the United States, right? I, I don't know that there's very many students here that can name, you know, a dozen of capitals to the United States. And if you ask them, even ones that are close, like what's the capital of Nevada. Anybody here under 30 know the capital of Nevada who didn't live there? No, it's Carson City. So this underscores this point that if I ask that question to this modern generation, they're just going to look it up, right? Yeah. Because they have that information at hand. So the, just as the internet has gobbled up the lower two layers of Bloom's taxonomy, AI is taking out those, those middle two layers. And in order for students to be able to be successful, they have to be able to leverage these tools, but also be able to have enough information in their heads to question the AI and question the biases at these levels. Because you get things on the internet that are completely false all the time. And as a person that isn't just so immersed in this world that you're talking about, you need to be able to make those distinctions and so, you, you know, as, as, as uh, academics, as people that are studying these things, we have to force ourselves to understand these lower levels so that we can create the, in, the important bias at the top level. So the second to the top level has everything to do with bias, applying correct biases. And just like what Connor was saying, we need to be able to have those biases working. There, it, when you fundamentally break down uh, AI technology, there is a curve of bias versus variance. And when you're making smart decisions about AI, you have to have this bias. You have to introduce bias into an AI. Otherwise, it's stuck between two propositions. So we have that bias, and it's a useful thing for us as humans. But I think in Deckard's world, you know, the bias is getting kicked out of him, right? So he's just acting like a robot themselves. So how many things do we do that are very robotic? Can I ask a quick question for Connor, yeah. too? Um, uh, I don't know if this is a good question, um, but uh, about the medical field, like, you made me realize that I, as a patient, have no clue which doctors that I go to use this AI technology or not to write up whatever about me. And I don't, one thing I don't understand is how that is possible that you have a whole industry, right? Like a whole range of human to human interactions where it's about our health and all of that. And we are not told as the patients that an, a particular doctor's office uses this technology or not. So, so I don't know if this is, you see, if this is helpful in any way, but, but I would want to see a, a scenario or a world where when I go to a doctor's office, I get asked for my permission or at least I'm informed about the fact that they're using AI to write up some things about me. 
Does that make sense? Like yeah. I'm really, I mean, you, your talk made me really aware that I need to ask these questions, number one, but number two, why, do, why is the responsibility on me? It should be on, on, on the, like the you, them, right? Like, like you were just saying too, Dave, like there's got to be more accountability and regulation of these companies that use AI, including now our doctors, who are supposed to be like, this is supposed to be like a, kind of almost like a sacred relationship, like you have it with your priest, okay? Because that's how I relate to my doctor. They know everything about me. No, oh, absolutely. I, um, I completely agree. And I think, honestly, what we need to have more is just more conversations like this. And especially, not to offend anyone, but I'm, I used to be an IT major. I know how IT majors and software developers are. They're not the most social people. And I think they need to have more conversations with insurance companies and healthcare providers in order to bridge that gap. So I think that's the biggest issue we face with AI integrating more and more into the healthcare system. It's not even just patients don't understand how it's being implemented. It's even doctors and healthcare providers. I mean, they're not, they're trained in, you know, learning about the human body, human anatomy, how to best take care of, our, of you know, us. But, when it comes to technology, when it comes to algorithms, uh, natural language processing, they, they need help to understand that. And so I absolutely, like I kind of tying it back into the speech, I, I completely agree with you. And I just think moving forward, we need to have um, software developers and AI professionals have those conversations more with our medical professionals so they can come together and kind of figure this out. Because no matter whether we like it or not, both technology, and you know, medical professions and fields are going to be more and more incorporated. So we just need to have more of an understanding just on all sides for sure. Yeah. Just one more. Okay. The time. Okay. Um, so I personally I do research with AI in healthcare and yeah. Um, and so I know and I'm familiar with uh, the inherent problems that exist within the healthcare system itself. Um, and a lot of the data that we use to train these models is built on those assumptions and ends up reinforcing those in, inequitable systems that exist. And so I, my question that I ask myself is like, are we actually ready to have AI in that space? Because currently it contributes to higher maternal morbidity rates in black women. Um, and so where, how can we make sure that it's not just perpetuating the systemic harms that exist? Yeah, totally. Um, I totally agree with you. Um, the, what's so frustrating is I wish we could put training wheels on AI and slow it down so we could have more policies and procedures in place. But unfortunately, that's not in the world we live in. Um, anything that can potentially you know, streamline and make things quicker, um, professionals are going to try and incorporate it. That's why I think, you know, it's kind of sounding kind of old now, but just having these conversations. Um, not even just with healthcare providers and, and software developers, but I think also with politicians and policymakers, just so we can discuss these issues and we can discuss the, the clear biases in AI. Just so if we are going to incorporate it into um, healthcare, which is inevitable, unfortunately, you know, marginalized groups can be better represented and they can also benefit from the technology. But yeah, absolutely, I wish that is um, something we can see in the future, is just get the, just have less biases in AI so we can all benefit from it. I have a really good quote here, too, from my research. Um, this is from an editorial in Nature magazine just this year on um, why scientists trust AI too much and what to do about it. Um, he says, there is also the illusion of objectivity in which researchers see AI systems as representing all possible viewpoints and not having or not having a viewpoint. In fact, these tools reflect only the viewpoints found in the data they have been trained on and are known to adopt the biases found in those data. Quote, there is a risk that we forget that there are certain questions we just can't answer about human beings and AI using AI tools, says Crockett. The illusion of objectivity is particularly worrying, worrying given the benefits of including diverse viewpoints in research. Well, thanks to everyone. Please join me in thanking uh, Our keynote address is coming up in 10 minutes.